The range of cameras that have been created over the years is vast. There have been cameras made for space, for inside the human body, for helping cars see, and of course, for capturing our everyday lives. Today, most of us take most of our photos and videos on our phone cameras, and they can do some pretty incredible things, like take 360-degree photos, record video in 4K, and help us meet new friends. Ever since last year, when I got to test out the camera on the Google Pixel, I've been curious to know, how can photos like these come out of a camera that's smaller than a fingernail? What's going on inside that I can't see? Since the Pixel 2 just came out, I thought it would be the perfect opportunity to run around Google, meet with the people who worked on its camera, and find out as much as I could. You ready for this, Noodles? There's not gonna be any turtle photos, but I promise there'll be a lot of other cool photos. Okay, let's go. The main challenge for building a phone camera is size. Since we want our phones to be light and thin, you essentially have the space of a blueberry for the camera to squeeze into. From the outside of the phone, you see the lens, which on the Pixel 2 is actually a stack of six lenses. And they have very strange shapes. They've got weird Ws in them and so on, because you're trying to correct for what are called aberrations that distort the image in a very small amount of space. This year, there's also optical image stabilization. There is an actual physical piece wrapped around the lenses, which has motors on it, and it can align the lens in a number of dimensions. Focusing moves the lenses in and out, while optical image stabilization moves them up, down, left, and right. You can see it moving around as it compensates for whatever your hand is doing. Then just a millimeter behind the lenses is a sensor, the equivalent of film for a digital camera. It's covered with light-sensitive photocytes, aka pixels, which capture the light and convert it into an electric signal. This year, the image sensor has 12 megapixels, but each of the pixel have left and right split. So it actually has 24 mega sub-pixels, if you will. We'll talk more about this later, but what's interesting to note now is it gives the sensor new capabilities related to depth of field and autofocus. Can you give a brief overview of what's happening when you take a photo? It's amazing that we can use a piece of silicon to take a picture at all. You wouldn't want to look at the picture that comes right off of the sensor. It's dark, it's green, it's got bad pixels that are stuck on. Even if you're not doing computational photography, there's a lot of processing that goes on to make that image into a good final photograph. And this sort of processing happens on all digital cameras. Each camera does things a bit differently, but on the Pixel 2, there are roughly 30 to 40 steps all in all. And for me, the first step was the most interesting to learn about. The sensor has a physical color filter laid out in a checkerboard pattern of red, green, and blue pixels. So instead of a pixel sensing all light colors, it senses just red, or just green, or just blue. And it collects twice as much green light because our eyes are more sensitive to green. And so you have to combine the red that was seen here from the green that was seen here with the blue that was seen here to make a color image. That's a process called demosaic. After this, the image will get gamma corrected, white balanced, denoised, sharpened, and much more. Traditionally, those steps have been done by hardware, meaning circuitry that is specialized to do that. But as the cameras begin to move toward computational photography, it's being done more and more in software. Computational photography can mean a lot of different things, but it's essentially advanced algorithms that superpower image processing. On the Pixel 2, there's two big features it enables, HDR Plus and Portrait Mode. When we set out to build HDR Plus, we wanted an algorithm that could take a small sensor and make it act like a really big sensor. And that means you get great low light performance and it has high dynamic range. So you can capture really dark things and really bright things in the same picture. To achieve this on a phone camera, every image you capture isn't one image, but a combination of up to 10 images, all of which have been underexposed to save both the dark parts and the bright parts of the scene. But HDR Plus isn't just averaging all these photos together, since hands can move or things in the scene can change. So we go through each tile of the image and we say, hmm, did that move from the other one? Could we move it a little bit and have it match up? Uh, we don't know where that one went, so we'll just discard that one tile of that one frame. We're very, very careful about avoiding ghosts. 
I like, I like how ghost is a technical term. It is. It means double image. After scaring the ghosts away, there's the aesthetic decision of how much to combine the dark and the light parts of the photo. If you take a picture in very dark light, by capturing a burst of pictures and averaging them together, we can make that shot look pretty good. But should we make it as bright as if you were in daylight? If we bring up all the dark shadows and we save all the highlights, then you end up with a very surrealistic or cartoony looking image. So we have to decide what to throw away. All right, pause. You see how Mark is in focus here while the background is blurred? That's called shallow depth of field and was achieved by filming using a fast lens and a wide aperture setting. Portrait mode is a new feature for Pixel 2 that recreates this look. But of course, on a phone, things are a little bit trickier. The lens is so tiny and the aperture is so small. When you just take a normal picture in, with a cell phone, everything is pretty much sharp. To overcome this, portrait mode uses a combination of machine learning and depth mapping. Instead of just treating each pixel just as a pixel, we try to understand what is it. Is it a person? Is it a background? What's exactly the meaning of this pixel? The team trained a neural network with almost a million examples of people and people wearing hats and holding ice cream cones and posing with their friends and their dogs to recognize what pixels are human foreground things and which are background things. This allows the algorithm to create a mask. And that mask says everything inside that mask should be left sharp. But then the question becomes, how much do you blur out the stuff outside of the mask? When we picked the hardware, we knew that we were getting this dual pixel sensor, where every pixel is actually split into two subpixels. So it's like your two eyes, it's getting two different views of the world from the left and right sides of a very, very small camera. And this tiny difference in perspective, smaller than the tip of a pencil, is enough to generate a rough depth map. And you roughly size the amount of blur to apply depending on how far away you think it is. So even if you take a photo of something that isn't a person, by using depth maps, portrait mode can create a nice macro looking shot. And if you like selfies, portrait mode works on the front facing camera as well. Before making this episode, I didn't realize the extent to which the cameras and our phones have been tested and tuned. There's a saying in engineering, if you haven't really tested, it's broken. And a lot of the camera quality really depends on how do you create the set of tests that allow you to know how well you're doing. Tuning a camera is a mix of art and physics with thousands of parameters to adjust. The problem is they all interfere with each other. You make one change and you have to figure out the 10 other things that it also affected and change those as well. For this reason, there's labs that run the camera through a gauntlet of automated tests, measuring autofocus, white balance, overall color and tone, resolution, and more. If this sort of testing wasn't able to happen, what do you think the consequences would be? Without it, it would be weeks and weeks just to get one data set and you couldn't iterate the way that we do with engineering. One of my favorite setups was a robotic stage called a hexapod that tests video stabilization. We can give the stage like different coordinates to go to, so we can give it a slow, gentle wave, or we can tell it to go rocking crazy. <laughs> this year, both optical and electronic image stabilization are being used for video. The first cracks for small motions, like a little bit of handshake, while the latter corrects for bigger motions. How it works is it looks at a video frame and then compares it to a few frames ahead using measurements from the gyroscope. So the gyro will tell you if you've moved this way or that way, and we use that to determine if this was random motion, then we take that motion and we cancel it out. There is so much going on inside a phone camera, like the one on the Pixel 2, that I could have easily made a video about just stabilization or autofocus or any other feature. In the course of making this video, I learned about so many different things, like the fact that to do autofocus in the dark, the Pixel 2 has a tiny infrared laser beam, and the back camera weighs 0.003 pounds, nearly as light as a paperclip. I know I just started to scratch the surface into how a phone camera works, which is an amazingly complex process. You may have noticed, but sprinkled throughout this episode were some photos taken on the Pixel 2 which was rated the best smartphone camera ever tested by DxO. And if you're interested in seeing more, you should check out this video, filmed on the Pixel 2 by myself and my friend Lo. Okay, that's all from me. Bye for now. Noodles is gonna take a nap, and you should go watch another video. See ya.